We're going to be in two passages of Scripture tonight. Uh, one will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. And the second one is, will be in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and those passages will be verses 1 to 5. So you'll be in 1 Corinthians this evening, and chapter 7, and 1 Timothy chapter 4. In both situations, in both texts, we'll be starting at the first verse. So we want to begin our reading first on the Corinthian passage and then move our way over to that of Timothy. And the sermon will pick up out of the Timothy passage. Beginning in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, Now concerning the things which you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power over her own body, but the husband. And also the husband has not power over his body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one for the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourself to prayer and fasting. Come again together, and that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Let's go down to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And in our reading there, uh, we'll begin at, at verse 1. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving, of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused, if to be received with prayer, received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now let's pray together. Fathers, we have before us these two sections of the scriptures, and we know that they are related. You designed it that way. We pray tonight that we'd be able to have harmony and uh, in the preaching, that it would come together to have one conclusive point. So we thank you for the clarity of word as it pertains to marriage and, and uh, singleness and human sexuality and all of these things that, that sometimes we're, we're not certain of. And so we pray this evening that once again, your word would demonstrate its clarity. Speak to us, Lord, and, and give us hearts by the operation and supervision of the Holy Spirit to be able to receive these things and use them for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, as the practice is, a, a, a spin-off or a continuation of the morning sermon, uh, most of the time on the same passages of Scripture, or at least the, the same theme that is there. So this morning, we basically were saying that the Scriptures were very lucid on the subject of sex in the Bible as it pertains to uh, marriage, singleness, and, and God's place for it. That is beautiful, that he created it. And it, it is that which uh, humanity, in the context of marriage, is meant to enjoy. However, in that day of the time of the Corinthians, the time of Timothy when Paul was writing, the first and second century, by that time an error had already crept into the church. And that error would, would teach that of self-denial, asceticism, and it may have come from one of two or perhaps three sources. We read in Timothy, and Timothy was a pastor at the church of Ephesus. And so the, the practice of that of self-denial uh, on the physical level was pretty much taught by the, a group of Jews known as the Essenes. And they believed that uh, this physical asceticism actually brought about a truer spirituality. And while they taught this, and the way that it was taught was the fact that they, they would practice this self-denial and uh, denying that marriage and then enforcing special dietary regulations, uh, that this would produce a stronger believer in the Christian faith. Now, and when they say the denying foods that we read here in verse 3 of Timothy, forbidding to marry, uh, and commanding a stain from meats, which God uh, has uh, created and were to be received. So when we look at our passage, we see that there are two abstinences that are being practiced, 
One is marriage and the other is food or particular kinds of food. Now there was another group found in the Greek culture and that gr group was what was been known as the philosophic dualism. Essentially they said this, the body, the human, a human is created in two parts. You have the spiritual side of an individual and then you have that of the material. Now they believed that the material world was evil and the spiritual world was that of good. And so when an individual was saved, they, they believed and taught that his spirit would be saved, but the body was still evil. And so in order to enhance the spiritual side, denial, self-denial, and physical pleasures of eating and marriage, etc., were to be denied. That, again, was something that would enhance the, uh, the spirituality of the believer. And then there was a third group that came in around in the second century, and all three of these, by the way, may have had some influence on the Corinthian church because of the Greek culture and because the Jews were part of the, Greek, of the uh, Corinthian church. And so as time would go by, um, the, 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 uh, the Essenes and the, um, that of the dualistic Greek culture would morph into what would be known later as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism basically would assume both views, the evil material, uh, the highly regarded spiritual side of man, which is good. So in order to have true spirituality, would deny uh, physical pleasures, but you would have to be in the know. Gnosticism means knowledge. And so you would be one of the spiritually elite. You've been blessed by God and your, your knowledge of, of a, a greater depth of understanding and intimacy with the scriptures and with, the, with God, etc. Uh, that was Gnosticism, but nevertheless, it still held to a, uh, a denial. At least one group of them did. They were actually split in half, but there was a group that would say abstinence. That would be the way to go. So it all gets down to this. When Tim Paul was writing to Timothy, he says that there are going to be in the last times, which had already started as he taught this, that there would be those groups that he calls it seducing spirit, doctrines of devils. In other words, it comes as demonic instruction. So the instruction that to deny marriage and to deny foods comes from the pit of hell is a, is a demonic uh, theology that enters in and is being then foisted upon the church. And he said, beware of this. Well, as we enter into this, uh, bring that into the 21st century church, other than uh, Catholicism, which would deny marriage and uh, promote celibacy, we probably don't have too many people that, that go wrong and say, listen, uh, don't eat and don't get married, stay single. Now, there may be some, but it's not necessarily for the purposes of spirituality. So does that mean then, because we don't necessarily have those kind of doctrines invading the church, does that mean that the passage, what is being taught then, doesn't have any relevance for the time in which we live today? And my answer to that would be, uh, no, it does not mean that at all. Even though that particular philosophical view may not be operative today, there is something that reflects that and mirrors this kind of teaching. And in both, in both of these areas, you would have those that on, the, on the side of foods that would have you running a very strict diet and denying the, the eating of meats to the extent that, yes, it does have a certain religion about it. Strict uh, dietarians, and uh, you're, it, it almost becomes a form of worship. And, it, but you don't hear too much of that. You almost have to get in, read deep, and uh, become part of a certain group and organization. But then on the other hand, what about that of marriage? Well, we don't necessarily have somebody entering into the church and say, listen, marriage is a bad thing. You don't want to do that. No, instead, uh, we, we do something different. And I'm not, when I say we, I'm talking about Christianity in general, all right? So I don't mean us as a group. But Christianity in general comes along and, and says this. Marriage is important, but we pretty much accepted the cultural practice that uh, before you get married, there are some things you have to consider. And one of the things to consider is compatibility. So essentially what has happened, rather than saying abstain from marriage, we say delay marriage. Delay marriage until you're, you find the right suitor, until you find somebody that is suitable for you. 
And they, they don't mean by way of a premarital counseling. Usually it's by way of are we compatible with each other under the same house? Do we have agreement on a host of many different things? Do we have agreement on our sexual practices? So that's, that tends to be the philosophy of the day, and it has found its way into the church. You, it's not unusual. It's not uncommon for, uh, especially in the larger churches, you have more of it, but it's not uncommon to, to have two people that are not married but yet have practiced what is called cohabitation. Oh, by the way, that is not new. Uh, back in the days of, of uh, early Rome, the first and second century, and I will, we'll look into this a little bit deeper next Sunday, but it, there was the practice of uh, communal marriage where a slave owner would allow two of the slaves to co- uh, cohabitate, and that would be accepted then after one year, that would be accepted as a bona fide marriage as per the government of Rome. And so those things did exist, but you have to remember, they existed in, in the unsaved world, and they also existed as slaves, and so they didn't have the, the privilege of saying, hey, boss, we want to go get married, and establishing then a traditional wedding ceremony. Only the, the elite of the Roman citizenry were able to do that. And so Paul speaks of that, and I think he addresses some of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So the, the, the text that we're looking at tonight, both in Timothy and in 1 Corinthians, uh, addresses the issue of uh, refusing to acknowledge the fact that marriage and foods are gifts from God and they are to be received with thanksgiving because they've been sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. This is what we read in our passage. For every, in verse 3, which God has created. So marriage sexual relationship in marriage and meats are created by God to be received. Here is the purpose for the creation of those two things, to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, the question this evening is this, in, uh, in terms of, you know, where is all of this leading? Is there any consequence uh, to a cheap marriage or to live-ins or to a same-sex marriage? Is there any consequence at all? Does it really matter if this is the trend and this is what people do, that even though they may be living together for several months or six months or a year, that eventually they're going to get married and all of a sudden it's, you know, praise God, we're glad they got married, etc. Do the consequences prior to that, are, what are they and who do they affect? Because if we do not see and understand that if uh, there's there's a violation of the Word of God on this subject, that here is a a demonic practice. It is an erroneous erroneous theology that is being promoted by virtue of practice without having it in writing. Are there consequences to that? How does God treat that subject? And that, that is what this sermon is about this evening. And I think part of the answer is going to be found. In fact, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, a, a well-known verse to all of us, whereby he tells us this, that whatsoever therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. God created all of us so that what we do, what we eat, and what we drink, so here we have practice, no matter what the practice is, in the context of 1 Timothy, in the practice of marriage, in the practice of sexual relationship, in the context of 1 Timothy, when we sit down to eat food, we are, as believers, because we are believers, because these things were created for us, our role in both of those categories is to bring glory to God. Now, once again, what we've done is elevated the, the bedroom of the marriage, and we bring it into the, the same language and the same view that God has toward it. So when, when Paul writes to Timothy, he said, these things are created by God and are to be received. He's not singling out, which uh, m- many a commentators like to do, is just single out uh, the food side because that's the easiest one to deal with. We know what our responsibility is when we sit down at the dinner table and we're going to eat. What are we supposed to do? Give thanks. We're supposed to thank the Lord for the food that has 
that has come our way. Is our microphone on up there, Damon? It is working. All right, thank you. So we know that. But did we ever take into consideration that uh, also sexual relationships and marriage fall under the same umbrella, the same practice to be received with thanksgiving because it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer? Now, as we move through the Timothy passage, we'll, we'll look at that and explain it. But just so we understand that when we fail to recognize the virtue of marriage, when we fail to recognize the goodness of food, and we fail to practice it the way that it is given to us out of this passage, we fail to bring glory and honor to God. Therein lies the consequence. And so therefore we, we, we have a cheap view of food. It becomes just very ordinary. It's something that everybody does. And then we end up having a cheap view of marriage and the intimacy that is to be involved in, in marriage itself. So as we, we move forward on this, we find that there were those three views that probably affected the church at that time. So what we read in verse 3 is that uh, marriage and food are to be gratefully received or gratefully shared is, is one way that we could translate that passage. Gratefully received and, and shared by the believer. And we know that because, as we've said, it's given to us to bring honor and glory to God. Now, what about the unbeliever? Is it possible that the unbeliever likewise can satisfy that ultimate intention? The answer is no, they cannot. Now, they would ex be expected to, but because he tells us uh, of them which believe, it raises the question, what of the, of the unbeliever? Now, he, as unbelievers, they can enjoy food and the grace of life, which comes from God. They can enjoy marriage, and we would advocate that the marriage vows and the institution of marriage and the practice of uh, purity in, in sex be honored, we can advocate that, preach it, teach it, and even uh, bring it into argue against uh, same-sex agendas. That is our obligation. And so we bring glory to God when we fight and stand for what is right. Well, because they're being unbelievers, they're not necessarily going to be able to bring the same level of glory because it's not in their heart. They don't see it as, as coming from God. But in the truest sense, we have the responsibility and the capability uh, to glorify God because of his goodness. But at the same time, when we fail to do that, when we reduce marriage to uh, if it works out for us or as a, uh, an escape valve for uh, uncontrolled passions, then we deny that right of glory and honor to God at the same time. So the, these deceivers would come along and just refuse to recognize. It's essentially saying this. We refuse to recognize that everything created by God is good. Or we may enter into it at another level. We, out of ignorance, we do not see that everything created by God is good. We just will say that it's created. And after a while, um, in our eating, for example, we like turn the blessing just into a ritual. Okay, who's going to say grace? Thank you, Ford, for this food. Amen. Um, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, whoever gets there first gets the most. You know, little things like that. And, and, and rather than sincerity of prayer. And what we find, what we're being taught here is uh, with that, it is nothing is to be rejected, but everything is to be received with gratitude. Verse 4, for every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. Now, when he says nothing to be refused, he's not necessarily saying that uh, all 
foods are meant to be eaten. I believe there are some foods that are not meant for human consumption. He's not speaking of the kind of food, but rather as an argument against the denial of eating food. You see the difference. For every creature is good and not to be refused. So um, marriage is not to be refused. Eating food is not to be refused. It's an argument against strict asceticism that would fit well with the, uh, the heresy of that day. That material things, the body is material, is evil. And he says, that's the wrong. And so he's arguing against it. Why? Because everything created by God is good. How do we know that? Because let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, begin our reading at verse 28. He makes it very clear, God's words on this subject. Genesis 1 and verse 28. Let me, excuse me, let's go to verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given to you every herb of bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, every tree which is the fruit of the tree, yielding seed to you shall be for meat. Every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and everything that creeps upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given green herb for meat, and so it was. In verse 31, And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So in our passage in Timothy, when he says that God has created, in verse 3, to be received. Verse 4, every creature of God is good. When you put the two together and put that right beside Genesis 131, created things by God are good. So what God created, marriage, sexual relationships in marriage, food, food to be eaten is good, not to be denied. And the denial of that or the failure to practice biblical God-honoring marriage in the Christian community is to deny that God created these good things and we bring them down to the ordinary, and it doesn't matter. Even in, in the participation of eating food, the failure to give God thanks, to sanctify that food, It is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. Both sanctified by God, by the Word, and by prayer. Now, what he means by that in verse 4, every creature is good, nothing be refused, received with thanksgiving in verse 5, for it is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. That phrase, the Word of God, first takes us to Genesis. There, God said, everything is good. And the husband and wife relationship with Adam and Eve, and the creation of foods. And so in, in that regard, it first takes us to Genesis, and then it would also, uh, sanctified by the Word of God, would take us to the New Testament, whereby the practices of asceticism, the practice of forbidding to eat meats, uh, following a strict Jewish dietary laws, and those things, those things were abrogated. So in that sense, sanctified by the Word of God, that God gave them a clear, clean bill of health on dietary foods, that it wasn't necessary to follow the the Jewish diets, that they now had liberty, with the exception, no drinking raw blood. And that was one of the things from the Jerusalem Council. So when Timothy uh, receives his word from Paul, and these instructions are given to them in regards to the practice of what to eat, what not to eat, asceticism, in the denial of marriage. Marriage is a bad thing because in that you have uh, intimacy, and intimacy is bad because it's physical pleasure. That's connected to the material world, the body that is evil. Paul says, no, none of that. In the 21st century, we may not think it is evil. We just don't, we, we do not see the value of marriage in itself, that it's a high calling of God, it's a gift of God, and, and so when it's reduced to that which is common and ordinary, mundane, 
we fail to recognize the created by and we exercise and practice these things to give glory to. So we have two counts against us when we fail to see created as good and fail to give glory because we fail to give thanks and see the, the sanctified by God in both. So we have to be careful of things that God has put and given priority to, a blessing upon, sanctified. We have to be careful that we, we don't treat them as ordinary practices as if we've always had it, but rather have to acknowledge that it came from God. So now when we move forward, we go to our, our passage then in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. So if Paul writes to Timothy and says marriage is a good thing and that it is a heresy that is going to creep into the church that don't really pay attention to marriage, going to have a cheap wedding or no wedding at all, Paul writes and addresses that because those same philosophies, uh, more than likely because they are of Greek culture and some of the Roman culture, found their way. And so Paul writes, and when he says, now concerning the things which you wrote, it was a question that they had. Whereof you wrote unto me, is it good that, that it is good for a man not to touch a woman? That is, not to have intimate sexual relationship. The reference is to marriage. Nevertheless, to avoid fornications, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So Paul recognizes that there is a place for celibacy, but the place is not in the marriage. And he promotes the marriage. He promotes uh, marital union. And just uh, for, the, for the sake of simplicity, as he warns of the heresy that's going to enter into the church to Timothy denying marriage, in Corinthians, he's telling him, telling the people, marriage is a good, honorable, God-designed institution that must be practiced. Timothy would hear it this way, that it must be practiced as being received, sanctified by the word of God, and to be received with thanksgiving. So Timothy and the pastor of the Corinthian church would hear two sides of the same subject because the philosophies of the day would have already entered into the church. And so Paul's writing to address those issues. So in this one phrase where he says, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband, I just want to give you um, five good reasons for a marriage. What are five um, reasons for marriage? And, and they all start this way. First, marriage is for procreation. When we look at Genesis 1, 28, we find there that Adam and Eve were instructed as a husband and wife to be fruitful and to multiply. So marriage is for procreation. It was meant and designed that there would be uh, the building up of the family unit, which would become eventually, in, in terms of na nationalities, tribal, and then nations, and then governments. But there would be the... the uh, multiplication of humanity upon the earth. But it wasn't just for that. It started with the need for a partner. So then we find that marriage is a partnership. The woman was created to be that helper, that helpmeet, the one that would complement his life. Someone that was suitable for him, Genesis 2 and verse 18. And so there would be this close friendship, this bonding that would take place, and, the, and it would be above all other friendships. And so their marriage is a partnership for these two people. And then, then out of that partnership, in, and then to complement the procreation, God would have it built in such a way that marriage would also be for pleasure. That in marriage there would be the pleasure of sexual unity. And the passage that we looked at this morning was that of Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, where he talks about the husband being ravished by the, 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 uh, the, his wife. And, and in that there would be this wonderful emotional um, 
elation that would take place. And as Solomon writes and brings this forth, we find that the scriptures are not ashamed to speak this way and bring us to the intimacy of the marital relationship in pure terms of pleasure. So marriage is for procreation, found in deep partnerships with a husband and wife. That would be the procreation would come about as a pleasurable experience. He moves from that to the New Testament. We find that marriage is a picture of the church. And, and uh, I'm not reading these because I believe that you're educated enough to know that. But in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that husbands sort of love their wives as Christ loved the church. And that he gave himself for it. For no man ever hated his own body, but rather he nourishes it and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church. And so as Paul writes, you, you wonder as he describes that and gives us that language in Ephesians chapter 5, is he, is he referring to the church or is he making a reference to marriage? Where, what is his emphasis here? And I would propose to you that he's actually speaking of both, that, that both complement one another. Marriage is, is a, uh, an image, a, an object, I should a picture of the relationship of Christ and the church, and the relationship of Christ and the church is built upon the intimacy and the oneness of a marriage, of a wedding. So marriage is a picture of the church. And then the last one is this, number five, that marriage is for purity. Marriage is for purity in that it protects us from sexual immorality. We said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Bible recognizes the God-given sexual desires in, human, in people. And so as part of the answer to that, first priority being the, uh, the beauty of marriage itself, but in answer to that then, as he says, but to avoid the fornications, that would be in the plural, let every man have his own wife. So now he introduces marriage, wedding. And so it is for purity. And with that, it serves as, as a protection for us. See, even though celibacy is good, so there is an element of truth that we'll, we, we read and we'll find later on in chapter 7 that Paul would not argue against celibacy, but it is not superior to marriage. So as the heresy would take the the, uh, the gift of celibacy, found in 1 Corinthians 7, around verse 25, as they would take that gift of celibacy and turn it upside down and say that it is that way because it is evil, material pleasures are evil, they would take celibacy and make it then as a doctrine. And it would be an erroneous doctrine because they would argue against uh, the superiority of marriage and wedding and things that pertain to it. So celibacy is good. It is not superior to marriage. And there are dangers and temptations that marriages do not have. So that, is, that would be his instruction on those first two. Now I've brought these, these two texts of Scripture to, together to, to help us understand that um, that God promotes marriage. He promotes intimacy. Uh, it is designed for, for pleasure. And at the same time, the distortion of that truth is when the emphasis is put on the intimacy and the pleasure first with a new catchphrase called compatibility. And, and that's not the end of it. I'm not going to go into some of the other more prevalent issues that are arising today and are being addressed by medications. I, I believe that the Bible has an answer to those kinds of advertisements. But nevertheless, what happens is that kind of thinking enters into the Christian community, and rather than looking to the Scriptures to find out what the answer is, we're all, people are almost led to believe that the Bible just doesn't harmonize with what's happening in the world and doesn't address this stuff at all. Like, these are brand new things that are happening. Does, the, does uh, the Bible have any understanding of ED at all? Does it really? 
You know, people are walking around scratching their head. Well, I don't think so. So we go to the physician. We need to dig. We have to understand the Bible does talk and speak of those kind of issues, but not in the way that we would expect it from your family physician or from your family psychologist or from any other means of counsel. So he places a high value in marriage. And, and these are some of the issues that come in that people are saying, Man, I don't know if I, if I want to get uh, married because if I fail in the, in the area of intimacy, then uh, there goes the wedding. And again, it's because of a distorted view of all the things that Paul talks about in Corinthians and in Proverbs and in Genesis. All this stuff is distorted. turns into a heresy. The heresy finds its way into the church. So therefore, there is no regard, absolute priority or superiority giving, given to marriage first. And that there is a way that some of the fears can be alleviated if it's first addressed from a biblical perspective. So while Timothy speaks of the heresy, Paul speaks of the superiority. And the two um, are necessary for Christians today to understand that there's a heresy by virtue of failing to give God glory and credit and thanksgiving for marriage, for eating. There's a, for by not seeing it as sanctified by the word of God. In other words, it's always been there. It's kind of like a revolutionary thought and not being received with thanksgiving. And so that's our heresy. That's our error that we can into and not even know that we're doing it. So now we have a heads up. Father, we pray that in the, the many good things that you've given to us, and there are many, that we would daily give you thanks. And thank you for wedding, for marriage, for intimacy, for food, for varieties, for taste. We know, Lord, that you redeem the whole individual. You have rescued and saved us in body, soul, and spirit. That we are not separate parts that you've redeemed and purchased the whole man. That our bodies are for your honor and not for immorality. And so, Lord, as the Lord for the body and the body for the Lord, that we would surrender all these things to you and then um, benefits that we have and receive day by day that we would once again say this comes from your hand and we want to thank you for it so that you can be glorified in Jesus name we pray amen